Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to see you here. Welcome to Trail College. I'm Dr. Michael Eamon. I'm the principal here at Trail College. And I just wanted to say a few words of welcome before we start this incredible evening with Hugh Siegel. Um, Trail College is where Trent University began 58 years ago. So 58 years ago, this is the space with Peter Robinson College and Rubich Hall. This is where the nascent university was set, started by Tom Simons, of course, who believed this should be Canada's university. And he worked hard in, throughout his entire life to support this university, especially in Canadian studies. And you'll hear a bit more about Canadian studies in its anniversary. But this whole idea of this space well, there are two spaces, Peter Robinson College and Trail College. Trail College was named after Catherine Parr Trail, uh, you know, both a naturalist and a scientist, a scientist and a writer. And so she had one foot firmly in the world of arts and one foot firmly in the sciences. And that seemed like the perfect type of person for Trent University to, to be a symbol of the next generation of students. Um, we can ask Michael Peter more about, of course, the Sisters in the Wilderness later, but, 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 you know, but we'll say, we'll put a pin in that for, for a bit. Um, but what, what's really special about Trail College, it was an all women's college. And it was not an all women's college as an exclusionary measure. It was an all women's college as a space of empowerment. Because in the 60s, there was a lot going on and there was a lot of barriers, but one of the largest barriers to higher education was getting women in higher education. And so Trail College was designed to empower and to give voices to women. And now that we're fully co-educational and, you know, and that's been the way since 1970, we are still a space, a safe space of empowerment and of conversation regardless of your background, your race, your gender. And so I um, welcome you here to Trail College in the space. I also am very grateful to be at Trail College and very grateful to be on the treaty and traditional territory of the Michisagi and Nishinaabeg. And I don't know if you know this, some of you who've heard me talk before, have heard me say this before, but for those who don't know this, for time out of memory, the Anishinaabe and their ancestors came through the space. In fact, there was a grand portage. This portage went all the way from Shimong Lake at the end of Shimong Road. This is what settlers do. They take portages and they turn them into roads. And so Shimong Road was the portage. And it came all the way to just near Trail College where the first European settlers in 1818 settled. And why did those first European settlers settle in 1818? Because this was a space where the Anishinaabe had been for time out of memory. And so this grand portage went from Shimong Lake all the way down to Little Lake. And for centuries, millennia, it was a space for the exchange of ideas and commodities. And so I'm very grateful to be in a space where we can continue that tradition and grateful for the traditional teachings of the Anishinaabe and for the tradition of exchange that we experience in this space. Now, I wanna welcome you here. And the final thing I wanna say, uh, just pretend this is an airplane. If something catches on fire, which I hope not, you know, I'm sure Hugh Siegel will light the world on fire, but this uh, space, if there, you need to ex exit, there is one exit there and a second exit out there. There are also washrooms out there as well, if you need to use them. And that's the technical part. And now I'd like to say it's my, it truly is, you know, people say it's my pleasure to introduce them and they, they don't mean it ever. But um, this time I really do mean that I, I mean, it is my true pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Kahn, who is our Vice President Academic and Provost. And people say, oh, he's a nice guy. He truly is a nice guy. Like everything that, that people don't really mean, put that on the top shelf because Michael Kahn is the nicest fellow you could ever meet. And he's our Provost and, Ac and VP Academic. So it is a true pleasure to have Michael Kahn here. And he's going to say a few words. Professor Kahn. Hello. It's interesting, but I don't, I don't know if that nice guy label sticks around budget time. Oh. <laughs> and Michael, I didn't realize, you know, the rich history of Trail College. Um, some of you may know I joined Trent about two and a half years ago, and we didn't have a home at the time. And actually, we stayed at Trail College for about three months. And what a fabulous host Michael, Michael was. But that was our, you know, initiation to Trent University. And it was absolutely fabulous. And we'll never forget that time that we spent at Trail College. So I know that a lot of the other principals are bugging me about which college I'm going to. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep it all a secret. But it's certainly, 
it's certainly a pleasure to be with you all here tonight um, to celebrate part of Canadian Studies 50th anniversary celebrations. Um, Canadian Studies began at Trent in 1972, and since that time has become one of the most and respected Canadian Studies programs in Canada. Trent was actually home to the first department of Canadian Studies in Canada, and we maintain a tradition of excellence in teaching as well as innovative curriculum that explore the question of Canada. We continue to be on the leading edge of thinking, writing and teaching about Canada, its history, governance and society. Our faculty are well-known scholars in their respective fields and contribute both to the life of the university and its students. Students are engaged in broad and interdisciplinary cur curriculum, something Trent is extremely well known for with a strong focus on events of significance at the personal, community, and national level. Their interest takes many shapes and forms, but it begins with a focus on knowing ourselves and understanding our relationship to the place in which we live. We explore new challenges that face Canadians and affect life in Canada, including reconciliation, climate change, politics, equity, and social justice. In keeping with this mission, this speaker series, Conversations in Honor of Tom Simons, our founding president, brings distinguished Canadians with a strong record of public service to Trent to share their insights and their experiences. Professor Simon's vision was to know ourselves. This conversation series reflects a commitment to continuing the tradition of self-reflection. This fall, it featured Thompson Highway, and in 2023, we'll also include Ambassador Jeanette Menzies, Senator Donna Dasko, and Dr. Beverly Baines. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Professor Christopher Dummett, faculty in the School for the Study of Canada, a well-known Canadian historian, to introduce tonight's speaker, Mr. Hugh Segal. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I feel like this is the... This is the answer to a joke about how many academics does it take to introduce a speaker or change the light bulb. The answer is three, I'm the last one. So we're okay, we're almost there. Uh, you're not here to listen to me, you're here to listen to our uh, distinguished speaker, Hugh Siegel, which is a great pleasure for me to welcome him to have just spent uh, a little bit of time having dinner with him. Uh, for me, uh, uh, Mr. Siegel was the man on, on the television in the, in the 19, early 1990s as I was uh, consumed with politics. And so I, I, I was, I, I suppose I was first you knew, knew you that way and have subsequently got to know Mr. Siegel in a whole host of ways, including the many books he's written. I'm supposed to do the usual thing here, and I will do the usual thing, which is to say that Hugh Siegel, for those of you who don't know him, has a list of things that when he's given these talks before, many people have listed, and they will begin with, to tell me if I'm getting this right, um, you know, obviously former advi advisors to Robert Stanfield, uh, federal uh, con progressive conservative leader, uh, Bill Davis, of course, uh, Ontario Premier, Chief of Staff to Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, just, 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 just at, at the best point in Mulroney's career uh, in the early 90s, very, 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 pretty easy time to be Chief of Staff to uh, the most unpopular Prime Minister in the country. Uh, and, uh, uh, and obviously, longtime uh, Senator, uh, he has had many academic uh, appointments, including uh, ongoing now and including as a, a master of uh, and, then, and then principal at Massey College um, position, basically, he's, he's just like Mike, Michael Eamon. Uh, uh, they're really the same. Uh, and but I, I, I would say those are the things I'm supposed to say, but I, I think I'm very pleased to welcome Hugh Siegel to Trent in particular because of uh, the Tom Simons connection. Uh, Tom Simons is very a, a special figure at Trent, I think to a lot of people in this room and even people who didn't know him have, have a sense of what he meant to a lot of, a lot, a lot of people and certainly meant a lot, uh, a lot to me personally. And it, it means a lot to know uh, about the connection that, that, that uh, Tom Simons had with, with Hugh Siegel. And I, I, I think of it in many ways, obviously a personal connection, but a shared sense of, 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 of a progressive conservatism. Uh, the way that they, they are similar kinds of figures. Uh, so it's a great honor uh, for, for, uh, for me to be the one to welcome Hugh Siegel to come and talk on 50 years of Canadian studies, small caps at Trent. Okay. I, I want to I thank Chris for going out of, out of his way to make, make reference to the fact that when I joined Mulroody in the 90s, that was the easy time. <laughs> Let me just replay the conversation at the dinner table in my home in Toronto at the time. 
I had a call and I then took a call from the prime minister and, and uh, thought about it for about 20, 30 seconds and decided I would take up his offer and go to Ottawa. And I sat down with Donna, who's a very bright, articulate woman with her own significant professional achievements. Uh, she was a senior civil servant at that point in the Ministry of Health in Ontario. And I said, Donna, you know, um, I can't think of any reason that a person from my humble beginnings would say no when a prime minister asked for help. She said, well, he's at seven points in the polls here, <laughs> which means that as we sit here tonight, more Canadians think Elvis Presley is alive <laughs> than are planning to vote for your prime minister. And I said, well, you know, you can't just go for the easy hits. And, uh, and so she was very understanding and um, she allowed me to go and, and was very supportive through the process. Um, I, and Chris was nice enough uh, to mention um, my time in the Senate. And uh, when I was in the Senate and I would go out and speak, of course, I was, I was a conservative in the Senate, but I was appointed by a liberal prime minister, by the prime minister Martin. And which meant that neither the liberals nor the conservatives trusted me. Uh, when I had the call from the prime minister, I was actually on the road, not far from here, driving up to Bancroft uh, to join some friends at a cottage. And, you know, the call comes in from the, um, from the prime minister's switchboard. Would you take a call from the prime minister? And you, know, you think about saying things like, no, I'm too busy. But no, I pulled off in a service station and took the call. And Mr. Martin, who I knew in other contexts, said, Huey Siegel, why would, I point, why would I point a smart guy like you to sit with that Stephen Harper crowd? That was his. And I said, uh, I don't know. Why would you do that, Prime Minister? And he said, well, you're bright enough. And we don't have a lot of Tories in the Senate. And we need some for the committees. So I think you'll do. I think you'll be all right. And, and, uh, and I said, well, you know, Prime Minister, if I'm sitting in the opposition party in the Senate, I will, by definition, be asking questions every day, which maybe do not reflect well on your government, because that's what oppositions do in our system. And he said, Huey, look, do what you like. I mean, I, you know, whatever, you know, and I'm thinking, OK, he is 25 points ahead in the polls as we speak, which which is where he was in the cycle at that point. And I said, you know, Prime Minister, if you are saying I can sit as a conservative, support Mr. Harper and be as tough minded as necessary. You are, that is really graceful on your part. And I think I'm speechless. He said, I hope you stay that way for the rest of your career. <laughs> it's the absolute truth. I can't make any of it up. Um, the uh, process that brought me into politics and connected me with Tom Simons uh, really related to my desire to be a progressive conservative federal candidate in the election of 1972. Um, and let me say that the riding I ran in Ottawa Centre had been a riding which had been held by the Liberals for the previous 40 years by substantive majorities. And so, you know, I could win the nomination because frankly, it wasn't all that a competitive a nomination. There are other people running, but, and we had a huge, wonderful slew of students from Carleton. And I, I, I had not quite finished graduating, just so we're clear when the nomination took place and they all poured in and we had a very successful meeting. And at one of the meetings uh, uh, during the actual election, so the liberal candidate was a lovely gentleman by the name of Hugh Poulin. He was a liberal lawyer and he had been George McElroy's campaign manager, George having held the seat for the liberals for about 30 years. And, and there was myself, there was a candidate from the Waffle in that election, and there was a candidate um, for the NDP. And because of that four-way split, I ended up doing far better comparatively. I didn't have to get a lot more votes, but I ended up only about 1,100 votes behind, the, uh, which is about a 550 vote margin. But at one of the actual public meetings, where you know each candidate speaks and there's questions. One gentleman got up and went to the microphone and he said, I need, I need, to, I need to understand this. 
The NDP candidate was a gentleman by the name of Irving Greenberg, who was chairman and CEO of a company called Minto Construction. By far the wealthiest man in the room, if not the wealthiest man in the city. Huey Poulin was the liberal and I was the uh, conservative. So the gentleman goes to the mic and says, can someone explain to me why the richest man on the stage is a new Democrat? And the poorest person on the stage is the Tory? What's wrong with this picture? So I went to Mike and I said, look, if I had his money, I'd be a new Democrat. <laughs> but I can't possibly. Um, part of what I think is important about Canadian studies is that we don't lose our sense of humor. Because it's a big part of our character as a society, one of our great strengths. Um, I ran for leader of the party in 1998 and uh, came second to Mr. Clark on the first ballot, but the gap was substantial. And let me just say that as I went across the country, knocking on doors, speaking at meetings, helping to raise money and all the rest, this group in this room would have been a monster rally. So if nothing else, politics teaches you um, the benefits of, of humility. Now, each of us in this room and the thousands of other students and faculty and researchers and readers and fans of Canadian studies as a multivariant academic discipline focused on our own country have traveled different paths or will travel roads in the future because they and we were attracted by a professor or an author or a movie or a reading or a book that lit the flame and ignited our focus and interest. In my case, it was my very great good fortune to meet Tom Simons when I was very young and Tom was in his prime. When you go through Tom's myriad of achievements, summed up succinctly and effectively by our ambassador to the United Nations, Bob Ray, when he said, and I quote, to me, he was the progenitor of Canadian studies. He just built things, end of quote. You get a small sense of how much Tom did, not only for this institution and Canadian studies, but for the country as a whole. From chairing the Association of Commonwealth Universities to being president and vice chancellor here, his Oxford on the autonomy, although he admitted that it was more like Durham College as opposed to an Oxford College, but I just point that out. Chairing the Ontario Human Rights Commission in its early days, establishing the second Pearson College in the entire world, uh, right here in Canada, in BC. His books written, commissions chaired, uh, one entry is missing. And it may be because those who wrote all those wonderful biographical notes didn't think it was important or Tom didn't think they should think it is important and it never got mentioned. It may have been too insignificant and temporary to earn any notice, but it was a central part of my young life. In the 1968 general election, Pierre Elliott Trudeau won a solid victory against the Progressive Conservative Party, led by its newly chosen leader, the Honorable Robert L. Stanfield, former Premier of Nova Scotia. Afterward, Mr. Stanfield had to deal with the traditional circular firing squad, known as the Progressive Conservative Parliamentary Caucus. Right-wing dissidents in the caucus, encouraged no less by the former Prime Minister of Canada, the Right Honourable John Diefenbaker, who was still the MP for Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, were split among moderate right and far right and extreme right and narrow right and silly right, <laughs> opposing things like official bilingualism and always making any policy coherence or congruity very difficult for the leader. So in his efforts to prepare for the 1972 federal election, Mr. Stanfield established the Aggressive Conservative Policy Advisory Committee and asked Tom Simons to be its volunteer chair. It was composed of caucus representatives from the middle, red Tory left, prairie right, elected members of the party's national executive, campaign officials, and its job was to prepare a directional policy framework that would be the basis for the party's 1972 election platform. The committee began to meet after the annual and general meeting in Ottawa in 1970. 
as I was the newly elected policy vice president of the Progressive Conservative Student Federation of Canada, I was the designated PCSF member to uh, serve on Dr. Simon's committee. Much of what I now know about politics and how politics and government and society work in Canada when they work relatively well, I learned by watching Dr. Simons run those potentially divisive and fractious meetings over many weeks and months. He was a masterful builder of consensus by blunting the edges of anger, dispute and contention in a unique way and cobbling together a common position. Let me tell you how he did it. When someone would ask a particularly silly or mean-spirited question, which happened a lot, Tom would pause. Now I'm about to go down an illegal road here, but it's, it's history, so bear with me. Take out his pipe, slowly fill the bowl, really slowly, tamping it down, and then taking a relatively long period of time to light the pipe. Now, of course, he'd, he'd be on charges if we did that now in a meeting, but back then, that's what he did. And that silence would actually make it possible for someone else on the committee to say something, to respond to some of the stupid things that had just been said, or maybe even make a positive or constructive suggestion. He used that to dilute the intensity of the right-wing contempt, or perhaps on occasion, actually get a fresh thought rolling. The other thing he did, by the way, was, and you may have, those of you who had the privilege of working with him, he had a silver tea thermos, which he brought with him to every meeting. So you think it takes a lot of time to damp down your, fill your bowl and damp down your pipe and light it properly? You ain't seen nothing until Tom decides it's time in the middle of the meeting to have a cup of tea. So you know, open the thermos and then you have to get the other stuff from your bag and lay out the silver cup and pour it ever so slowly and stir it, etc. All of which became absolutely tactical ways to keep the committee from blowing itself up, which it would have done were it not for his leadership. As the youngest person on the committee, I would watch all of this in awe. In his own congenial, diplomatic, and creative way, he accommodated radically different views on issues like social or economic policy, federal provincial relations, defense, foreign policy, by nudging the committee towards a coherent and focused common ground. His silver thermos with tea, his pipe, he brought several to the meeting, and his pouches of tobacco, because at different parts of the day you had different tobacco, you didn't just stick with one brand all day, really became the bridges over which some civility were built, was built in those, in those circumstances. And over many meetings and many weeks of this approach to chairing the meetings, Tom produced a coherent, well-informed, balanced policy framework on which the party could successfully campaign from coast to coast. Now, the election in 72 was supposed to be a slam dunk for the Liberals and Pierre Elliott Trudeau. The Liberals lost their overwhelming majority. The Progressive Conservatives radically increased their seats in every single province, except for Quebec. Mr. Stanfield came within two seats. The final score was 109 for the Liberals and 107 for the Progressive Conservatives. And in two of those seats, the margin between the Liberal and the Conservative was less than three votes. Now, I can't think of a closer election in our national history. A liberal romp became the closest expression of public ambivalence about who to choose for the government of Canada. The platform based on Tom's efforts allowed the often taciturn and uncharismatic, but wholly decent, bright and pragmatic Bob Stanfield to gain strong national support for ideas like welfare reform, a guaranteed annual income, enhanced national defense, a more moderate and fair taxation system, and a federal system where the provinces and Ottawa found common ground on important social and economic initiatives. Mr. Stanfield was soft-spoken and diligent. No double half gainers off diving boards, which to his credit, Mr. Trudeau used effectively in 1968. Rather, he advanced a vision that was more humane and compassionate than anyone might have thought possible of any party with the word conservative in its title. 
some of its membership were, shall we say, not as humane as com or compassionate as the platform or as Mr. Stanfield himself. There are many compelling pieces to the multifaceted Canadian studies discipline as offered by Canadian universities and colleges from coast to coast. Literature to film, history to politics, natural landscape, remarkable geography, unique Canadian sociologies, the central and most important core thematic of our First Nations and the indigenous foundations of life on the northern part of Turtle Island, from the multiracial and multicultural urban communities to the unique mix of small town lifestyles and microeconomies that compete with the large urban centers for priority on the national political economic agenda in Ottawa. The Canadian studies discipline is very broad and very inclusive. If I had to summarize what good emerged from the last half century since Thomas Simons created the Canadian studies thematic for advanced post-secondary and graduate study, I would argue that it raised the analysis of all aspects of Canadian history, Canadian politics, Canadian creative arts, to a level of relevance up to or greater than the study of all things European or American, which had dominated the academy for many years before then. I was very young in 1972, when the creation of Canadian studies was launched at various universities by a broad range of fascinating and inspired academics. And these included disciplines like history and anthropology and political science, sociology, literature. Over the years, at various Canadian universities, degrees in Canadian studies embraced researching the way governments in Canada operate, the study of the French language, French Canadian literature and history, Canadian literature writ large, Canadian geography, Canada's social structure, microeconomics in different parts of Canada, local and regional First Nations, Canadian art and photography, Canada at war, Canada in the world, and the impact of other societies on Canada itself. As was referenced in one of my three introductions before I spoke, to know ourselves, the report of the Commission on Canadian Studies chaired by Tom was an in-depth multi-volume analysis of the state of the discipline across Canada. The availability of good sources and financial support that was necessary to broaden and strengthen this academic pursuit for the future. This was done for the Association of Universities Colleges nationwide and was the report that defined the future of Canadian studies going forward. It says something quite profound about Tom that he was not only a key innovator in, 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 of the launch of Canadian studies, but also one of its toughest critics in terms of whether it had the resources or the sources necessary to really broaden as a, as a discipline that will attract the best scholars and the best students. We must also reflect on some of the other atmospheric pressures in the beginning of the 1970s of Canadian universities, which helped shape this departure. The imbalance in the United States between the modest amount of available academic spots in American universities and the large amount of PhDs who were graduating from American universities produced, along with undergraduate students who were driven in part uh, to come to Canada because of the pressures of the American draft, produced a palpable anxiety that the American influx on our campuses might get in the way of Canadian academics achieving some measure of professional progress within the Canadian institutional academic field. Canadian studies was and is an affirmation that we're not merely a derivative culture or society, simply the product of ancestral histories in Europe or cultural pressures from the South. In the indigenous foundations of humanity north of the 49th, in our literature, culture, anthropology, sociology, and politics, there was a clear and unique Canadian experience and character worth knowing, understanding, researching, and writing about. That the initial points of departure for this self-knowledge field of study were laudatory, embracing the best and the brightest, underlining the differences they made aspects of our society look good, sound ever better, and in some respects be better than other places is not surprising that a more angst-ridden contemporary societal view in our time now finds colonialism under every rock and racism in every nook and cranny of our history should also not be surprising. 
any academic discipline in our present context has to be influenced by the presentism of judging the past by standards that did not then exist, but would be completely intolerant, intolerable today. So if the past five decades of Canadian studies have been a mix of celebration and discovery of those aspects of our history, literature, et cetera, that were are unique to Canada, I would submit that the design of curriculum elements going forward needs to be shaped by what we have come to understand about the present dimensions and pressures defining the Canadian condition in ways that will shape our collective future in this country. It has been my experience in dealing with many thoughtful and competent political scientists, and I reference Queens, but other places as well. There's often a research bias on the part of those political scientists in favor of comparative international political science, which means that, of course, international travel can be part of their research work funded by the usual sources. I'm not being cynical, I'm just reporting in. Now, what this can produce, of course, are political science or political studies departments where there are no professors studying, researching, or teaching about Canada. And trust me, it's a problem in more than one institution in this country. How's that for a potential setback for Canadian studies? This anomaly actually suggests an area of curriculum development in Canadian studies, which is the structure of Canada's societal institutions involving those in the not-for-profit sector, like universities and hospitals and school boards, conservation authorities, cultural institutions, religious denominations, non-government regulatory bodies like the provincial colleges of physicians and surgeons, along with the other non-government regulatory bodies like the provincial law society, trade unions and public sector unions. These sorts of organizations have a powerful impact on the daily lives of millions of Canadians but are not usually the focus of detailed academic research or teaching. Other societal sources of influence, like First Nations federations, chambers of commerce, industry associations, the Canadian Legion, medical associations are rarely studied or taught in our universities or colleges, yet they are very substantial elements of our way of life in this country. I would also argue that Canadian studies as an academic discipline has, as a general rule, left the study of matters military in Canada simply to the broad category of the history of Canada at war. I contend that the very nature of military service, organization, deployment, and culture in Canada is unique from that which might exist among our NATO allies, from the US to the UK, from France to Poland, or from Sweden to Spain. Understanding that cultural difference should be an important part of any Canadian studies student's understanding of Canada's present and proximate future, choices and challenges, especially when in the post fall of the Berlin Wall peace that we were enjoying, now having been shattered by our Russian friends, the understanding of how our military works may be in fact more and more important. I would also argue that if Canadian studies is to be consistently relevant as an academic area of pursuit, we need to get beyond the dynamics of simply the multiculturalism of the 1970s and develop a strong curriculum around the impact on Canadian society writ large of the multiracial and multi-ethnic ways of immigration that have enriched our country, contributed to our economic growth, and made our political and social diversity as Canadians even more compelling. Institutional study of how well or otherwise our political parties, service organizations, trade and public sector unions have adapted to this shift in population demographics would also be of immense value. With the present government committing to an annual goal of 500,000 immigrants annually, which I applaud, these are important areas that engaged in contemporary Canadian studies curriculum should embrace and develop. We have some unique cultures in Canada that are unique to this country and how we operate things and understanding them well makes a big difference. You know, do we have a public service federally where the operating culture is really about process and never about results? And is that the fault of the people in the public service or is it the fault of the political framework within which they operate? But a lot of Canadians would be interested to know what the answer to that question is. Um, we have a military culture, which is unique. We have a cultural dynamic in the way in which businesses deal with government in Canada, which is different 
from the way that happens in the United Kingdom or the United States. When it was my great privilege to lead the Institute for Research on Public Policy in Montreal between 1999 and 2006, which by the way was promised in Mr. Trudeau, the father's first throne speech, and was then put together by the provinces and others as a, as a funding organization that would fund independent research. The federal government matched what the private sector could raise. Um, I was a great proponent of what I called search conferences. Not a symposia where researchers brought in their work and analysis on issues or policies of the past or present, but conferences where bright young researchers, practitioners and academics made a reasoned case for what issues and problems in the social and economic context, the global security context needed to be more fully understood and why. For Canadian studies to be more than a celebration and study of the past and present of the Canadian reality, it must at some level be a perpetual search conference about the challenges, opportunities and dynamics both at home and abroad that will help shape the future of our country. And in this respect, being as enthusiastic about addressing areas of policy and cultural narrowness or weakness will be as important as cataloging the immense and varied strengths of our way of life. Phenomena like uh, narrow ideology, ideologically driven parties, uh, right-wing extremism, we would have said some years ago, really has nothing to do with us. Actually, it does. And it's not, there's not enough study and research being done on its sources and its implications. In the 1972 election I mentioned earlier this evening, in which the policy work done by Thomas Simons had such great and positive effect, the government slogan, Pierre Trudeau's slogan was, and I quote, the land is strong, implying complacency and, you know, we're in charge, don't mess with us. It also implied a disconnect from the challenges faced by everyday Canadians. The PC slogan under Mr. Stanfield was a progressive conservative government will do better. Not deep, not intellectually awash, but nevertheless, it spoke to the public anxiety about the economy and the level of unemployment, and it committed to a brighter future and doing the hard work to make that future happen. Mr. Stanfield, with Dr. Simon's policy priorities, focused on that future. And that is what Canadian studies must do to continue to generate the dynamism, relevance, and interest amongst the best of scholars, students, and researchers who will keep the Canadian studies world engaged, energetic, and compelling. A solid agenda for the next half century. Thank you all very much. So I, we, we would welcome questions on a, a, any uh, aspects of the talk and, and otherwise. You, you mentioned the decline in Canadian studies academics and that some universities, uh, this is a serious challenge, and that probably could carry over to student interest also. Can you comment on the parallel or maybe coincidence of this and government's so-called focus on job-ready skills, which tend to be focused on STEM subjects? Right. So um, having taken Latin as opposed to math, because uh, I wouldn't have survived the math, just so we're clear, you'll, you'll understand there's a bias to my answer. Um, I think if you look at, uh, and we, you all see them with your own graduate, I see them with our business school and other graduates at Queens, um, the amount of those young men and women who are now hired to work for globally focused corporations um, because of their skill set and their academic achievement and their intellectual acuity uh, does not, in my view, exclude those who've spent time building up an absolute warehouse intellectually of understanding of their own country. And if you look at all the significant immigration trends and the economic trends, and even the climate change challenges, Canada will become more and more central. And it'll be in corporations' interest and government's interest to hire people who have that clear, precise, um, uh, intellectual understanding of their own country. So do I, do I think that people should hope that if they only have a degree in Canadian studies or they don't, they don't add to that with some other work, their chances will be as good as those who've been a bit more diverse in how they put together their curriculum choices? No, 
But I don't think that being a student in Canadian studies, the undergraduate level or the graduate level necessarily suggests that you're not going to be looking for other uh, attainable academic areas of, of acuity with which you can advance your career. We got a quote from you for our review book. Be my guest. <laughs> Question in the back. Um, Arnold of Irish, uh, proud of Trent uh, Canadian Indigenous Studies grad, class of 95. Uh, your comment on presentism was uh, interesting. And I, I would ask, how do we judge then those voices in the wilderness uh, back in the 1800s, like Dr. Peter Bryce, that were raising concerns about the treatment of the indigenous peoples in Canada? How do we judge them who were speaking out at that particular time? And the voices today that are speaking out about issues that maybe 30 or 40, 50 years down the road will be looked upon differently as well. I would argue that the way to address uh, people like the individual you referenced and those who are now expressing deep concerns about the future in a host of areas is to deal with what they're saying with respect, to integrate the arguments they're making into our overall analysis, um, but also not to destroy all of Canadian history because there was a thematic in this country as there were in many European uh, uh, settled countries of a measure of colonialism and bigotry and the rest. Uh, the issue is to look at the strengths and the weaknesses, to identify them, be frank about both. We went through quite a debate in Kingston about the removal of the Sir John A. Macdonald statue from City Park. And um, I must say uh, the debate at our city council was actually very thoughtful and very engaged. And it wasn't about good guys and bad guys or how dare you? It wasn't that kind of discussion. It was a discussion about what was the right thing to do. And the conclusion was to remove the statue. I personally would not have been in favor of that, but I respect those who were. And to uh, re-erect it in the Cataraqui Cemetery where Sir John A. is buried and where his grave, which is on a hill and where there are ceremonies twice a year on his birthday, on the anniversary of his death, overlooks an area where we can put out chairs and things for students and others. And that would be a place, in my view, where seminars about the strengths of Sir John A. and the weaknesses and the, and the areas of collective social bigotry he inherited and didn't do much about uh, should be part of the debate. So should the, uh, the, act, the, the bill in, nine, in 1872, which he brought in to give First Nations the vote and women the vote, being the first leader of any government to do that in that point in the history of the world. It didn't pass. The Quebec caucus of the Tory party could be counted upon to vote against anything progressive, and they did. Um, but I, all I think we need to do is ensure that we look at all the information, we assess it honorably, and we make it part of the narrative today about what happened in the past as a source of inspiration and education, but we must not allow to happen now or in the future. That would be my take question here from online, from the, from the, the, uh, the other digital space. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say it's, it's not a trend question, so I'm very upset with this question. Uh, but it does, is one, the question uh, 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 asking what to your re recollections of Dr. Stephen Clarkson, uh, who is an advocate uh, at, for Kane Studies at the University of Toronto. Well, I knew Stephen before he passed. Um, I knew him when he was married to Adrian before that marriage um, changed. Um, he was extremely articulate and direct. I think he made a substantial impact at the University of Toronto. And I think the level of Canadian focused studies, not only in history, political science and literature, but in some of the uh, scientific disciplines where the work of Canadian uh, scientists became part of what was being considered in the curriculum was advanced remarkably because of his hard work. And we lost him too young and he made a superb contribution. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Tico, I'm, I'm Rosemary Gadley, an engaged citizen. And, and I really enjoyed uh, your presentation, especially the research, research areas uh, that are under research yeah. and would help our national identity and contribution to the world. I just want to suggest one and it's women's studies, especially, yeah. especially, I personally went to Ottawa, called by my sisters in 1984 wow. to make sure that gender was in the charter of rights. Yeah. 
So, and, and, but, but you covered many of those research areas <laughs> that are under research, and then your point about more teaching, more teaching about us and, and our history. But I wonder if I could persuade you to get into the muddy waters of today and to comment. We always looked at you as a, a very um, reasonable red Tory. And I just, could I get you to talk about the Conservative Party today? The Federal Conservative Party today. Yeah, well, let me just say, for those of us who are red Tories, there's nothing to protect us now in Ontario but the hunting laws. That's how bad it is. I'm being honest with you. Um, look, um, I have known Mr. Polyev for many years. We were in the same conservative caucus together. He was an MP from the Ottawa area and I was a senator. Um, and uh, I have no way of judging whether what he has said or what he used to broaden his campaign reach reflected sincere views on his part, which they may have, or reflected what was deemed to be appropriate for the purpose of assembling a victory. Uh, and the two are not the same. Uh, and my worry, frankly, and I've said this before, so I'm glad to say it here and I appreciate the question. Um, the only way the Conservative Party of Canada can be a competitive alternative to the present government is if it does not allow itself to be taped over into the narrow right. And that is, in my judgment, where it is now headed. Um, you don't have to be a radically left-wing Tory to say peace, order, and good government are underlying constitutional values that matter. Well, taking coffee down to the truckers who are breaking the law does not sustain peace, order, and good government, frankly. And do I believe that truckers have the right to demonstrate? Of course they do. All Canadians have the right to demonstrate. Do they have the right to occupy a city for three, uh, three weeks and intimidate the residents and go into the local uh, shelters for low-income people and steal the food? No, they don't have the right to do that. But that's what was going on in our nation's capital. And so in that respect, I'm of the view that Pierre Polyev will have to make a decision. He's either going to stick with the truckers who clearly joined the party in great numbers to assist him to win the leadership, which is completely legitimate, free country. Or he's going to start talking to all the, I think by the last count, the 66% of Canadians who didn't approve of what the truckers were doing. He has a choice to make. And, um, and I don't know what choice he's going to make. And I can reassure you that when he, is, when he seeks counsel on that matter, my phone will not ring. <laughs> Uh, and that will be the choice he has to make. And as a lifelong progressive conservative, I'm hopeful that he makes the right choice, but I have no reason to believe that he will. Sir. That was, I really enjoyed that. I just wanted to pivot upon, I hate to use the word pivot after <laughs> all this COVID, but let's move back to Tom Simon's legacy and uh, Canadian studies. And, and as you clearly pointed out, 1972, was Trent and many other universities yeah. embraced the Canadian studies model and then to know ourselves further kind of added fuel to that, including the federal government getting involved in creating Canadian studies programs around the world. Mm -hmm. And as you know, in the past couple of decades, they've been shuttered and sent, shut down. And well, because the, because the government withdrew financial support. When I, I, was in, I was in Germany on a NATO thing as part of my Senate work, and I met with um, our Canadian embassy people in Berlin, and, and they were as unhappy about the shuttering uh, of the Canadian Studies program, but those programs, you know, Mulroney used to say this to me most mornings. I would send home seven or eight legal bags of briefing material, mostly foreign policy related. And I once asked him one morning, I said, Prime Minister, why do you want all the foreign policy material? We're not going to get elected or defeated because of foreign policy, said Huey. There isn't one leader in the world, not one, who wakes up in the morning turns to his or her spouse and says, I wonder what's going on in Canada today. So my job as prime minister is to go through all those uh, mission reports, well, what's going on and find linkages that I can draw. You know, a French company is trying to sell something in Gabon, right? And they're not getting a response. And our embassy people pick that up. And Marouni knows the head of Gabon. 
And he is prepared to call the head of Gabon and say, you really should give that French company another look. And then he'll call the president of France and say, guess what? You're going to get a call from the Gabonese mission in Paris to do another proposal. He would do that all the time because he felt he had to build leverage with powers around the world. So when Canada needed something, there were people who would engage. And I don't think many prime ministers have done that as well. I think the present government is beginning to understand that that's important. Um, and, uh, and, and I would think that um, the way to make the Canadian studies thing work around the world is to get large corporate players in those parts of the world who are dealing with Canada, who understand that it's in their interest to help finance a solid academic program in Canadian studies in a local university in their, in their part of the world. That's the way to do it. Because look, every time the finance minister or treasury board tells departments to cut, guess what? They don't cut stuff at home. They don't cut their own salaries. They don't cut their own, they find things far away that they can cut because no one's gonna notice. And that's what would have happened with Canadian studies in many European institutions. And I think it was a travesty. Yes. Oh, sorry. At the back, I think. No, I would, uh, Brother Grant, yes, sir. Just a, a you uh, kind of an observation, I think, that for most of us who have spent time around Trent and yep. Canadian studies and, and seeing the evolution of and the evolution of, of, of the activity. How do we encourage younger graduate, ready to move professors or assistant professors, whatever, to join the Canadian Studies program? I mean, we're all getting older. And this isn't just a trend, it's everywhere. Yes. But we're not encouraged. I used to have hair when I ran for parliament. <laughs> yeah, I know. But what we, what we do need is some kind of concentrated activity to say, yeah. Canadian Studies is here to stay. It's something we have to understand. If you're a CEO of a company and you've got multinational activities, you've got this and that, you've got to know Canadian Studies in, in, in all its dimensions, not just, uh, you know, Canadian Studies or anthropology or whatever whatever be the geography. Yeah. But well, I think we're losing the advantage as a small country to not put some effort, maybe it's part of its corporate, which I was involved in too, to end to say, let's make this thing really happen and be big. Because if not, we're just not going to retire into the distance and the people say, oh, well, we're, we, we were good at Canadian studies because Tom and Simon said we were good. <laughs> Days are gone. And, and, and I think we need to really start <coughs> So, well, so, some people get involved, become professors, become heads of departments, and generally really start. I would say um, I don't have a full answer to the question because it's a very substantial uh, question. I would say that part of what you need to do, what we need to do, is to broaden the curriculum so the sorts of things being looked at, uh, the structure and organization of trade unions, the structure and organizations of business government relations. How are they different in Canada? Why do they matter? The more we can do that, the more we, and, the, we, and, and by, uh, by perhaps encouraging joint appointments, people who are appointed in the Department of Economics and in the School of Canadian Studies, because there's no reason for those, those particular disciplines to sep be separated or divided. Um, and if I think of uh, Queens, for example, there's a whole bunch of people who when the department of uh, the School of Policy Studies started some years ago, were jointly appointed. They're in the economics department, they're in the law school and at, Canadian, at the School of Policy Studies. And that's how you produce another thread of young academics who will realize that in terms of research and scholarship and opportunity, the Canadian studies thing is actually quite attractive. But you have to be quite organized about making sure they're exposed to it and not seduced by their own narrow discipline, not to be part. And for the question that was asked earlier about women's, women's studies, which is very important, um, I wouldn't wanna look at trade unions without looking at the role of women in trade unions. I wouldn't wanna look at the political culture of our parties without looking at what has been the role of women and how that has been either encouraged or frankly discouraged over the past. I think we have to therefore 
build the linkages which bring people with other disciplines into Canadian studies because it becomes an area of rich um, 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 intellectual pursuit and something where they see some good career prospects for themselves. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I actually, so I'm a student in Canadian studies right now um, at the undergraduate level. Yep. And so I appreciate the question, and my question kind of bounces off of it, but from the flip side. Um, do you mind if I elaborate on one thing that you said? Be a little bit. As a student in Canadian studies, I think that one thing that draws the people into the program here at Trent is our cross-listed courses. So it's what you're talking about by bringing people with different disciplines in. When we can take courses that are cross-listed with other disciplines, it allows people who did not start out in Canadian studies program to see what Canadian studies is all about. And that pulls people into the program. So it's making sure that the cross-listed courses are also being taught by people who have a fundamental understanding of what Canadian studies is. But that's a topic for a different day. The question that I wanted to ask is, how can I, as a young Canadian studies student, kind of get involved in that scholarship process? And what do you see as the future for somebody who is like in Canadian studies right now? What is the, the future potential for continuing on the pathway to becoming one of the Canadian studies scholars that you were talking about being fundamental at, like advancing the program in these universities? Yeah, sorry, we just had an online question. We can't hear the questions. So oh. I thought, ah, I didn't, I didn't, couldn't run up to you with the mic. I wondered if you could very quickly summarize yeah, that very so <laughs> you, you correct me if I get it wrong. So one of our colleagues in the audience, who is a Canadian Studies undergraduate student, asked, what can we do to broaden the linkages between Canadian Studies and other disciplines so as to let the people in Canadian studies and those in other disciplines understand the benefit of doing both and, and building a career intellectually and academically around that mixed uh, range. Is that close? Yeah. yeah, and then my second question is for people who are focused from the beginning on Canadian studies, how do we continue on our intellectual path? Do we have to go into a silo discipline or is it feasible for us to continue as a Canadian studies, like a student or a scholar of Canadian studies for our entire academic career. So the question for the people online was if you're an undergraduate student in Canadian studies and you enjoy what you're doing, but you want to stay with it, what are the options by which you can do that so you can broaden your base and become a scholar and a professor or whatever in that area of activity? Well, look, um, it's really simple and complex. The simple part is it's about a choice series of choices that one makes for their graduate work. And whether that is the sort of thing which accommodates and complements Canadian studies or sends you in a completely different direction. And I would think if the undergraduate was interested in maintaining a relationship with Canadian studies for career and intellectual purposes, then they would pick as their next uh, area of advanced study at the master's level, um, an area of anthropology, or sociology or political studies um, or economics that would allow them to connect the Canadian studies background they have with the nature of what they're next going to do. And they would produce in a perfect world if they went to the doctoral level, some new knowledge based on their analysis which would be of huge value to the country as a whole and to future generations of Canadian studies students. That's what I would say. Yes, ma'am. And I would like just like to make a comment. I know that Canadian Forces College, which is at how to follow in Toronto by Don Mel, when they educate people for military, they have students all over the world from different military. Join the beginning. Okay. So I was just this was a comment regarding Canadian Forces College, which is situated Hogs Hollow, Don's Mill in Toronto. When they educate people in regards to military, they have people from different countries in the military all over the world. And when you walk in the door, you see the flags, of the students there. So I think my invitation is to you, when you look at people like Bob Dollard, who uses the college, people like James Babinski with yep. Doctors Without Borders, if you have them come here or you go there, that would really follow up in your suggestion, which I think is excellent. So um, I'm glad you mentioned the Canadian Forces College. I just finished 
five years as its honorary colonel. <laughs> Uh, so I have some intimacy with the curriculum development. And, and I just want to say that I think your suggestion is superb. Um, I think it would be in the interest of the Canadian Forces College and its purposes mm. to send some of its experts who have the areas that you've talked about mm -hmm. out to Canadian studies programs right across the country. And I think it would be of great value for the Canadian Forces College to invite Canadian studies scholars to come in and do oh, right. panels and discussions. So not only our military, who are all at the rank of mm -hmm. major, hoping to be lieutenant colonels, mm -hmm. or our allies and friends from around the world, get a sense of how deep the Canadian studies discipline is and how important it is. Because if you get a series of foreign officers who leave Canada and say, you know what? We haven't done enough work on Canada in our own military college. Mm -hmm. It's time for us to dig in deeper because there's a lot more to understand. And there are allies of ours, and it's important. And the same thing would be true if they came here. And I think exposing our undergraduate graduate students to men and women in uniform who cared about their country and have a particular view of why the military is part of our culture, uh, I think that'd be mutually beneficial. I think there are generals like Hillier that would be excellent and has done a lot of work with Invictus Games. And I know the troops loved him. And I know his influence even without that is, is really profound within, within the world or within Canada. Yep. Thanks very much Thank for you. answering my question, your Thank question. You. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Laurie Clark over there. Yes, Laurie. <laughs> just holler, Laurie, just holler. <laughs> um, Jeffrey Simpson wrote a very interesting article in the Globe and Mail a few weeks ago in the Saturday Globe and Mail on the decline and fall of the Liberal Party, arguing that uh, under the Trudeau Liberals, the Liberals have gone, gone woke. I'm not sure Simpson himself used that uh, term, but you've talked about how you think the Conservatives under Poilievre have gone to the extreme right and I'm just interested in how you would maybe characterize uh, the Liberal Party. Some would argue that something similar has happened there in that they have gone so far to the left that it is leading, uh, counting a kind of uh, pushback from the right. Um, and as part of that, I guess I'd also like to ask you why you are continue to be a red Tory as opposed to becoming a liberal? Well, my answer to the last question would be simply on grounds of good taste. <laughs> um, look, um, the Progressive Conservative Party as a party has alternated from the right to the left center position over its history. Um, you know, uh, uh, R.B. Bennett, brought in his version of the New Deal too late, but it was a very radical departure from traditional Canadian economic and social policy, which would have made any member of the CCF stand up and cheer because it was necessary and it was appropriate. And the tradition of Canadian conservatism is not the American tradition, thank goodness. It's not the European tradition where it's about some things which are quite awful. And it's certainly not the British tradition where it's largely about class. Canadian conservatism was about the mix of prairie populism, small town Canadian business ethics, inherent decency and desire for stability and balance. That's what it is at its best. And when that gets expressed, it does really, really well. When it allows itself to get seduced by the far right, it just takes itself off, I would say, the stage of relevance. Um, let me say this about Justin Trudeau. Um, I actually think that when you look at, for example, his uh, appearance uh, before the inquiry in Ottawa uh, the other day on the um, use of the Emergency Act, he was there for, I think, seven hours. I cannot think of a prime minister who answered questions more honestly, more directly, more effectively, did not use any political games, just went at it as, a, as someone who showed a measure of intellect and grasp of detail, 
quite frankly, surprise me. And I think part of our politics in this country in the last few elections has been to count him out before an election. And then all of a sudden, there we are. And I think it's because uh, the other parties have not undertaken what I would call a meaningful intellectual effort to build an option on the center right that would be attractive to more Canadians than the present mix of people who are thinking about voting conservative. Um, and my view is a red Tory. Uh, I mean, uh, at my age, active politics isn't that much of a pressing issue. Uh, as I say, I can sit by the phone for many long hours, but it just doesn't ring. Um, at my age, I'm of the view that political parties are essentially instruments of trust. And they have to find a way to earn that trust through every generation and every election. And so far, uh, in our system of first past the post and all the inequities in that, Mr. Trudeau now for several elections has found a way to earn that trust. And the Conservatives under Mr. Harper in 2015, under Mr. Scheer, have really not had uh, Mr. O'Toole, really haven't had that success. And until they get serious, until they put together a policy advisory committee headed by someone with the depth, skill, decency, and humanity of a Tom Simons, they ain't gonna get there. And that is not going on. Party policy is decided by votes at party meetings, and that always goes to the lowest common denominator, which means it may make people in the room feel really good, but it'll have no impact of substance outside the hall. Uh, maybe we'll take the last question. Um, just to connect with, with something you just raised. Oh, okay. <laughs> just to connect uh, with something you just raised. Um, a lot of people would argue that, that we, we need to fundamentally change our electoral systems and move towards proportional representation or, or to move, move towards uh, transferable votes or, or other, other combinations. It doesn't look as though that will ever happen because those, those in power uh, having espoused it before, and we saw that with, with the Trudeau Liberals, yeah. drop it pretty quickly because, my, my gosh, we can actually hang on to, uh, to power if we don't have to share. Do you think there are any prospects of ever moving in the direction of, of electoral reform? I think there are, and I don't think it's in the direction of kind of a Israel slice, Italy kind of proportional representation. I think that's perhaps a touch too radical because of Canada's massive geography and the fact that there are different interests region by region, we have to have a system that rewards place and votes in a way that is reasonably balanced. So I, I have always liked, frankly, the New Zealand system where you have local MPs who are elected in the normal way like we do here in Canada. And, and then if on election, and, and, and each party puts out a list of others who might be elected who are not running locally, and if on election night, um, the percentage of vote received by the parties is greater than the amount of actual seats they got, then you can allocate from that other list, which was public, to make the representation in the Parliament of New Zealand more reflective of actually how New Zealanders voted. So I think that kind of system is possible. And if I were a betting person, I would say it's more likely to start in a province. Uh, where most good things start anyway, think of Tommy Douglas and healthcare, um, then nationally because of the pressures that you referenced so accurately. What a privilege it's been uh, to hear Hugh Siegel reflect on the past 50 years of Canadian studies and who better to do it uh, and, and to say what's been covered and what's been left out because chances are he was there. Um, in fact, I, I've often thought of him as being at the crossroads of history more often than Forrest Gump. Now, uh, in, in addition to being having a long career himself, Hugh has also been able to put things in perspective for us tonight because of his professional and personal friendships with so many people over the years. He mentioned Stephen Clarkson, of course, his long friendship with Tom Simons. Now, when I first met Hugh, he was working for the federal leader of the opposition, Robert Stanfield. I was interviewing him 
for an undergraduate essay on the role of the leader's office. And although he was barely older than I was, he had already run for office, as he mentioned, and almost won a seat in the House of Commons, not to mention being a former president of the uh, University of Ottawa Students' Union. Uh, he'd served on an advisory committee with then Education Minister Bill Davis, and on and on. And I think he was the only person I know who's never had to look for a job, because he's always been spotted in various roles and recruited elsewhere. Um, anyway, uh, people, um, I'm just, I, I was furiously taking notes during Hugh's talk tonight because he just raised so many things. But um, one thing that's always struck me about Hugh, when people meet him today, they're always surprised how young he is because he's had this long career. Isn't he that fellow who worked in the premier's office for Bill Davis or in the prime minister's office for Brian Mulroney? And the answer is, yeah, he's had a long career, but he started as a child. <laughs> when he was 12, John Diefenbaker visited his school and Hugh quickly tossed aside his hockey skates and started campaigning and going to policy conferences. And so it's no wonder that, that he has so much experience. Um, now, speaking of John Diefenbaker, I think he would be the first person to acknowledge the chief's various foibles, but uh, Hugh has never forgotten um, Diefenbaker's great belief in human rights and his concern for the poor. And if you read Hugh's most recent book, Bootstraps Need Boots, which I highly recommend, you'll understand why um, Hugh has made it his life's work to campaign for a guaranteed annual income. Now, political strategist, constitutional negotiator, senator, columnist, and now an academic, uh, Hugh has done it all and he's still thriving. He told me earlier, he's lecturing in various departments at Queens. He's also uh, involved in mid-career uh, two-week programs for mid-career civil servants and so forth. He is still taking all this experience and, and giving back. We are just so fortunate that he came to Peterborough tonight to share his insights with us, both in this room and online and in the future uh, to anyone who would wish to watch the video recording. So Hugh, on behalf of all of us, I would like to express our heartfelt thanks and uh, to give you this small token of our appreciation. Okay, I think I think I'm the last person to come up again just to say thanks to, for people to coming and to remind people. Although we're very pleased uh, uh, with tonight's event, there are actually a host of other events. So if we could check out the the, the Trent Canadian Studies 50th anniversary website. Uh, you can see all those events, and I think there are the brochures on the way out. Is that right, Janine? Yeah. So if you're here in person, you can obviously do that. If you're here digitally, you can. Uh, uh, Google is your friend. Uh, uh, although I think that the, the link might, might provide it for you somewhere up there. Oh yeah. The next talk is, of course, Jeanette Menzies, uh, ambassador uh, of Canada to Iceland, a former uh, a former uh, a student. Uh, okay. So thanks very much, and we'll look forward to seeing you at future uh, uh, talks. Even uh, even you, Mr. Siegel, if you'd like to come back, I it'd be fantastic as well. Okay. Thank you so much.